где тащи себе я очень правильно. So how much are we? Cold. Cold. It ended cold. I thought, I thought that yesterday morning was colder than today. And they said it was going to be the opposite. But I think that I'm about to say it was warmer than yesterday morning. But it's been beautiful. It's been good. Had a little bit of rain Friday, right? Kind of the story of the week, right? We had 80s one day, almost 80s one day, and then barely 50s yesterday. But that's kind of the that's kind of the way life works, right? We have we have trials and, and valleys, and then we have these highs and these experiences that are great. And and I have to believe that this week you saw trials. You, there were things that weren't easy. You had to overcome. You had to uh, find your way through some difficulty. And as I thought about you this week, I have been praying. And I, and I thought that I would let you know what it is. Now, typically, when I do, it's every uh, 7 a.m. ish, and then 4 o'clock ish. I stop what I'm doing, and I pray for both Maple Wood and, and the Graph people as a community as a whole. And it's usually all of Ephesians three is usually where I start. But I want you to hear uh, verses 17 and 18. I want you to hear. Uh, verses 17 and 18, and realize that there's somebody that prays these words for you every day. And then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. That your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And that you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. I feel that when you can do this, you begin to see God work and move. He's working around you and he's working through you. He's working inside you and he's working outside of you. Remember, do not be afraid. There's nothing to fear. Whatever it is that you need, there will be enough of it. And whatever you think that you lack and don't have the ability to do, you are enough for the task at hand, whatever that may be. We started this series last week, and we picked up, right? We, we, we picked back off of the, the uh, purpose that we talked about uh, the month before. We talked about purpose. And now this month, we are now talking more about what do I do with it? How do I take this purpose that I feel that God's given me, and how do I put it into something that's tangible? How can I use maybe my hands, maybe my feet, maybe my wallet, maybe my time? What can I use in order to make God known and be seen? How do I live into that purpose, right? And so last week we talked about love one another. And our love, the love that we used last week to describe this is that family, right? That group of people that comes together and takes care of each other, even though sometimes they disagree and they fuss and they fight, they still come together and they love each other, right? Sometimes that takes uh, forgiving, it takes serving, it takes doing, it takes all of those pieces for that to happen. And so today we're going to focus a little bit on that serving part. Now, you don't always know the difference between love one another and serve one another because love is often, as believers in Christ, love is often used as a verb. And so love and serve are often intertwined, right? We think of love, but we think of serve, and those are kind of the same thing. I had a chance, and if you have not seen it, I'll, I'll try to make sure we get it on YouTube because I realized after first service, the, the, the one was Wednesday, the Wednesday wasn't on YouTube yet. I'll try to make sure I get that uploaded. But if you had a chance to see it on Facebook, we talked about 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. And I'll read it to you what it says. This is kind of our way of gearing ourselves towards today. And in 1 Peter, it says, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. 
Meaning you guys are each unique, you're not the same. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Then do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. And then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Now, I am, I'm going to be interactive today. Okay? This is your chance to shine. Hopefully without me knocking the microphone off. This is your chance to shine. Now I want to know, how many of you believe what I just read in 1 Peter 4? How many of you think that's true? Getting a little bit of response. You've got a couple of hands that went up that time. That's good. That's good. And what I mean, what I'm saying is, how many of you believe that God has given each of you a gift from his variety of spiritual gifts? Quite a few hands, right? We believe that. Now, how many of you believe that you personally have been given a gift from God, something that sets you apart, something that makes you unique, and that God desires you to use that gift? It's pretty close to the same hands that went. Unfortunately, you just implicated yourself. Because that means, I believe God gave me a spiritual gift. I believe that he gave me a gift to use. Uh -oh. See how that works? See how scripture convicts us, right? <laughs> it makes us see God speaking to us, and we're like, yeah, I agree, I agree, I agree. Then he wants you to do something. Ooh. Yeah, man. I'm out. I honestly believe that the, the, the original church, if you go back and watch where Peter started, Right? Day of Pentecost, Peter came out and filled with the Holy Spirit, began to preach the, the message of Jesus Christ, and, and the church was born, essentially. And so that early church really began to look like what they wanted the church to be. And Paul would later write all these letters to the church, and go back and read the epistles that Paul wrote. Every one of these are to these churches for a specific reason, and most of them are because they lost their way and weren't the church anymore. They, they wanted church to be a community. They wanted it to be a place where people felt like they belonged. They belonged there because everybody that's there believed that what you believe, they believe that, you know, there is a Father and a Son and the Holy Spirit, that the three are one, they came, Jesus came and died for our sins. We just read all of that in the Apostles' Creed, right? We believe those things together, and if we believe them, then we should take care of each other, right? And I've often said that, man, if the church would have just continued to be the church, even when we brought it, uh, you know, over the, the ocean to the United States, if we would have just continued to be the church, there would have never been a time in our history as Americans where we would have needed any type of government assistance programs. And you say, why? Well, that's because the church would take care of its community. They would provide for the widows and orphans. They would give shelter to those who had that. They would provide food to the hungry. They, you see where I'm going with this, right? That's in scripture. And are we doing that as a church? Do our communities think to themselves, man, I need something, I'm hurting this week, I can't make it, can I go to that church and get what I need? They should be able to, right? We should be that for each other. That's what this says. This New Testament church, though, was the absolute epitome of functionality. Everybody had a job. And every part and aspect of your job was the task of enabling the church to grow. And then I feel like somewhere, maybe we got too far gone and too far lost in the 90s or something when we, we wanted to be entertained at church. We, we missed the, the part where we were actually fed and then we went out and did things. 
you know? But, but I feel like church, slowly over time, has become a place where we just, we show up on Sunday, we get entertained, we leave. Our, our pews are not filled with people wanting to go preach the gospel because there's a guy that already does that, I don't have to do that. And that's unfortunately not what the church is supposed to be. I think of John Wesley. John Wesley wanted to, to create, and he called them societies. He didn't even want to call them churches. Because what he did was he went from society to society and traveled. And as he got there, he raised up these leaders, right? He grabbed a handful of leaders that, that were accountable and held. They, they, they were asked to do, they were asked to serve, they were asked to speak and preach, they were asked to teach. They were to lead their society, their church. And then he would leave and he'd travel to the next one. And he would go on that circuit and he would touch each one of them over and over and over again, right? Make sure, hey, are you guys doing what you're supposed to be doing? Are you living how you're supposed to be living? You taking care of each other in your community. That was the church that John Wesley started. I don't know how we got to this point, what we're doing now. I mean, things change, traditions move, society and culture are sometimes demanded, right? But somehow we've gotten there to where we don't think about our own selves in ways of doing or serving. Because there's already people that are doing that, I don't need to do that. There's already things happening, mine is silly and dumb, I don't want to do that. I don't want to step out and say I can do this because then they're going to expect it every time and I'm like, I want to do it every time. Been there, done that. And that's okay. In today's text, we saw Paul's words to the, to the church in Galatia. And he's talking about ways in which their actions are providing for everyone else or for the church. He says, for you've been called to live in freedom. We have, right? We accept Christ into our life. He changes us and he gives us a freedom. God does that innately. We could have chosen this morning to sleep in. We didn't. Why? Because God's going to say something to me today. That's why I wanted to come to church. Because I hope that's why you came to church. I know sometimes when I was some of these young folks' age, I was going because I had to. <laughs> but it worked out all right. Don't worry. For you have been called to live in freedom, he says, brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. How many of us, and I talked about this last week, right? When we love someone else, but we want to love them in a way that works out for us, right? Like, oh man, we got to carry it today, right? Oh, I made these amazing cookies. They're all, they're my favorite. And I made them maybe because I like them, not because I know you're going to like them. Or maybe, maybe we do something because, well, I'm going to be there that day. I might as well hold the bag or pick up some trash. I'm going to be there, so I might as well do that. I think what, what Paul is asking us to do is that we don't satisfy our selfishness, what he's calling that sinful nature, but we start to begin to satisfy and have a desire to satisfy that nature of God. Use your freedom to serve one another in love, he says. That love that we talked about last week, that's a verb, right? Come sometimes we call it serve. <laughs> and he goes back to Jesus' words. He says, For the whole law can be summed up in this one command love your neighbor as yourself. Wow. It goes right back to what Jesus said. And we know that Jesus said that the, the whole law can, can be done in two things, right? Love God, love your neighbor. Those are verbs. They're not just words that we want to read. They're not just thumbs up on a Facebook post. They're not. They are verbs. They are actions. They are doing. And I love the, the, the warning signs that he gives us too, right? And this is for us as the church. But if you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Now how many of you have been in a church where you see that happening? Right? These people are Christians and yet they're all talking about each other and they're all pushing each other because they want the best position, right? 
We've been through that. We've seen that. That's not what he's calling the church to be, though, is it? He says, beware of destroying one another. That's one of those one another's I didn't include this week, but beware of destroying one another. How many of us can see our, our current church in this, or maybe even church that we've been through before? Both the good and the bad, right? Both the serving and the biting and devouring each other. Our culture and our society continues daily to put pressure on you to think about yourself. Right? <clears throat> oh, that, that, that car isn't good enough for you anymore. It's a couple years old. It's got some miles on it. You need another one. But that house isn't good enough. You gotta watch HGTV so you can find out what the new cool big things are they need to buy or sell or increase, right? Every commercial, every commercial that you watch if you're watching television, every single commercial is telling you something about you isn't good enough and you need this product to make you better. It's true, that's our society, that's our culture, that's what we build. Unfortunately, the church was never built on that. The church was built around, none of us are worthy, only Christ saves us, and guess what? We are all in this together, and it's time to come together, lift each other up, and move as a church. Love your neighbor as yourself. Stop satisfying your sinful nature. Love your neighbor as yourself. I'm going to be working on board that's going to take the place of the, uh, with the help of uh, my, my helpful friend, Kyra. And that's okay. I didn't tell you to bring anything. Uh, see? You put that pressure on yourself. <laughs> you can do whatever you want, and then I'll be ready, okay? Maybe not, even then. But I'm working on a board that we're going to put out there, and it's going to list ways that you can volunteer. The different places that you can use your time, maybe your gifts and talents, ways that you can volunteer your time, whether it's helping with the, the Five Loaves Food Pantry, or whether it's helping with First Wednesday, even if it's helping after First Wednesday to clean up and turn tables down, put things away, right? There's always something for you to do. Maybe you can help Grace, you can help pack the backpacks and box of kids, right? You can do that too. There's so many other things that we can do. Maybe there's something that you're thinking of, a need that you see in your community, and nobody's even thought about it yet, and that's what you want to start. That's what this would be for. Also on this board are going to be ways in which you can actually get involved in your church. I talked about this this week. Uh, we first started this conversation at the SPRC meeting that we had this week. Uh, what's SPRC? Okay, well, SPRC is the group of people within your church that are responsible for your pastor and any employees. They're my boss, basically. And if I'm not going to do my job, they're going to let me know. Hopefully. I hope you do. Call me out sometimes. Sometimes I might need it. They're also going to talk about their employees. They, they, they are the, the, the glue that holds the, the structure of the church together. They have uh, to come up with breakthrough goals every year. They have to do assessments of employees. Right? They've got to take care of, of the, uh, the smart goals that we're going to be looking to set for the next year. Things that we want to accomplish, things that we want to do as, as a church. These are, these are some of your better leaders. And I told them on Monday night, I said, you know, we, we've got to get past this stigma. We've got to stop treating these meetings like it's, uh, I'm going to the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> you know who you are. If I had a mirror, I would look at myself. <laughs> meetings. Oh, more meetings. Why are we meeting all the time? And I said, the problem is, is we're not actually, we're not going into this feeling as though we're doing ministry, so we're going to stop calling them committees. This coming year, they're not a committee anymore. You're going to be on a ministry team. You're going to be asked to be on a ministry team. And that ministry team is going to do ministry for your church. <laughs> now, it may look different, but I, I want to focus in on making sure that every time we meet together, whatever we do, wherever we meet, we meet with a purpose, and we meet to build ourselves up, that we edify each other, we affirm our faith, 
We, we, and we believe stronger than we left. We believe stronger than we showed up, right? I want us to have that empowerment, like, wow, man, I gotta come back next week for this meeting. We did some good stuff today. That's what my hope is for you as the church. I so despise the term committee because it's just so dark. So we, uh, ministry team, I want you to feel as though whatever it is that you're doing, you're using your talents and your gift for ministry. You are making decisions and doing things that are going to change this church to make it yours so that you can help and address your community. That's what this was designed for, right? That's why we asked to serve. See, there's so many ways that you can serve, and most of them don't even cost you a dime. Most of them just cost you time and your effort. You have an opportunity to make this church whatever you want it to be. You do. I believe that, 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 that somehow within our, our, our culture, society, whatever you want to call it, our seminaries, whatever we've done, we, we've turned church into a place where the CEO pastor addresses his employees and then points out certain ones to do the tasks that he sets forth. And I think that's wrong. I don't think there was a single disciple, I don't think Paul himself ever thought of himself as a CEO, as the owner of a business, as the ruler over a body of people. I feel as though that he felt that maybe God was calling him to empower, to encourage, and to influence people, that they would rise up together and that they would be the church. If you think about it, Paul traveled did stay on the planet. A lot of those early disciples who became the builders of the church, they moved a lot. They, they had to, or for fear of death. But they had to go and empower people. And the point that we're missing a lot, we were called because God met us where we were. He met us in our mistakes. He met us. He humbled us. And you know what? We found great joy in being saved by Christ. You remember when you felt that way? Like, oh man, I, re I remember when Jesus came to me, when I had that first experience, when he set my heart free from all that sin, all that junk I had in my life. Serving one another means you want somebody else to experience what you, you found in Jesus. So that they can have that same joy that you have. How many do you think that if you served with that mindset, that it might make you serve a lot more? Yeah. I want you to see the Jesus that saved me. I want you to see the Jesus that changed my heart. I want you to find the Jesus that came and made me a better person. Who's made me a better father, who's made me a better son, who's made me a better employee. I want you to know that Jesus because he's changed my life. That's what the serving is that we should be doing. Now we are going to have an opportunity starting this week. On Thursday night, we, we change it to Tuesday and Thursday because it's, it's, it's a little easier on the future schedule. Tuesdays are packed full of stuff, but <clears throat> Thursday night here, at 6 o'clock, we're going to meet and have uh, what we call faith builders. It's a fancy way of saying if you want to be a new member or you want to be in your faith. We're going to talk about why, we believe what we, why do we believe what we believe? Who is God? Why do I need him and why do I care? What is it that we do? This session of faith builders, we're actually going to include some things. We're going to include uh, positions on these ministry teams that you're talking about. Things that you can do inside the church walls that will actually influence things that happen outside. How can you be involved? How can you be in? We're going to take a spiritual gifts assessment. We're going to find out what it is that, that you know, God, what did God bless me with? Where does he build my self to be? How is he going to be able to use me? All of these things are hopefully designed to empower us to love our neighbor. I want our church to be more reflective of the New Testament church and the gospel.
the message of Jesus Christ. I want us to be open to stretching and pushing ourselves outside of our comfort zones because that's the only way God's going to move a mountain is if we use our hands to do it. I can honestly tell you that my life would not be the same if I just sat in my seat and just came to church. I would have never been able to be the thing or the, 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 the tool, the instrument that God is attempting to use if I would have just sat still. I remember it was about seven years ago, I think. It was probably about seven years ago. And, and, and I, I noticed that, that my mom was taking uh, Grady to, to school. To school. <laughs> she was taking Grady to, to church with her on Sunday mornings. And my wife and I were, eh, you know, if Grady's going, we should probably go to. We should probably just be sitting at home, sleeping in, getting a break from the kid, just because he wants to go, to, just because he's going to church with grandma. It felt good, trust me. You didn't have a screaming kid wake up, wake you up, you know, early. You didn't have a diaper change, you didn't have anything. But we decided that it was time for that part of our life to be made different. It's time for us to engage in that, that spiritual aspect of our life. And I remember, because I had been hurt by the church so many times. I had been pushed away, I had been tossed out, I had been cast aside, and I didn't want anything to do with the organized church. And I remember walking in the doors of Maplewood, and then Bill Walter was there. And I remember looking at Bill, you've heard me tell you this story before. I remember looking at Bill, and I remember saying, don't ask me to do anything, don't ask me to say anything, don't ask me to volunteer for anything, because I'm not even that. I'm here for my son, my wife. Somehow, <laughs> I ended up in a small group. And I ended up the chairperson of the SDRC committee. And I don't even know how that happened. I woke up one day and went, wait, 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 wait. I did not want this responsibility. I remember going to a small group. Uh, we, we had a, 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 an adult small group, a couples group that we met, and it was designed around your relationship with your wife and your spouse. And so we wanted a better relationship, and so we went. Next thing we know, we can't live without this group because every time we go, something amazing happens. We feel so filled with the Holy Spirit. We feel so made into something different. We would we would struggle. Okay, I got we got to get this kid here. We got to get that kid here. Uh, maybe we should just go. And I'm telling you, there's nights that we didn't. There were nights that we made us too much. But when we did, when we made the sacrifice, and we tried to adjust the schedules and make it work, man, God changed us. He pushed us. He stretched us. He moved us. I was talking after church in Maplewood just with one of those people that was in that group. She said, man, I really wish we could get that back. And I said, but what you don't understand is God doesn't want us to get that back. That's not fair. Look at where we've come. Look at what we are doing. Look at where we are going. God used that group to change every single one of us, and we are fully equipped now for what God is asking us to do now. I said, the better question is, what group needs to start next? What group of people needs to start next to do next? Who needs to, to, who needs to figure out how to make sacrifices work? So you can meet every week at this time and push each other, stretch each other, and love each other. We were there for each other when parents had passed, or when kids were having trouble, or somebody needed a, a, a pick-me-up. We were always there for each other. Still are. That's what God is asking us to do. In order for us to serve, we have to be moving and changing. If we aren't, we're just going to sit in that seat, and I'm not pointing at you. You're going to have to pointing at that. Uh, I'm pointing at that person. You're going to sit in that seat, and you're just going to keep doing the same things over and over. Some of you might be getting a letter today. Some aren't here to get their letter. What this letter is, is this letter is a formal letter 
offering you a position within one of our 2020 ministry teams. When we were sitting uh, Thursday night and we were talking about what it is that we were doing, I said, you know what? You know the thing that we don't do? We either want to pick up a phone and call somebody and ask, or we want to uh, send a text or send an email. Let's go old school. Let's do this professionally. Let's, let's let somebody know, you know what, you, you matter enough to me and to this church family. We thought of you when we were praying and going over these things. We asked. We want you. And we want it formally announced. You're gonna, and your letter's going to be your name, the, the position, and the ministry team that you're looking for, or we're looking for you to fill. You can say no, and you can say yes. That's totally up to you. Sometimes God's going to lead you to say no. And if it's a season in your life, you need to say no. That's okay, too. There's other people that we've already put in place in case you have to say no, right? But this letter is for you because we think you're important. We think you're valuable, and it's an actual offer. Just like a job, but this is more for your heart. It's an official offer for you to be a part of something greater. You're willing to do whatever. Now, some of you didn't get a letter. What's that mean for you? Oh, boy, you don't think that much of me. I didn't get a letter. You might have the most difficult job of all. 